Well, let, let's get started. I want to be sensitive to Rabbi Terrigan's time. Uh, it's really a big zechus to be able to have uh, Rabbi Terrigan with us, and uh, one of the most sought after and foremost uh, speakers, lecturers, Tamidei Chachamim. And uh, it's great to see everyone here this morning joining us uh, for this exciting program. And I want to invite uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Rabbi Jill Finkelstein, uh, to kind of take it away and introduce uh, Rabbi Terrigan to all of you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Learfield, and the pleasure to partner with Baron Hirsch uh, together to bring in Rabbi Moshe Terrigan, uh, really a very old friend and uh, an amazing uh, mentor and uh, Rebbe of my son, Atani, who's a very finicky about his Rebbe's, and he, he was in his shir for most of the year, and he was at well, one of the years when he was at Yeshivat Haratzion, and he served as a wonderful mentor for him and my other cho children who were there as well. Uh, Rabbi Terrigan uh, was, uh, was a real star when he was back at, at Yeshiva University. Uh, he, began, he became a prominent assistant rabbi at one of the prominent congregations nearby. Uh, he was sought after at uh, students who were uh, at Columbia, who enjoyed uh, hearing a shear from him. And, um, and he's really a master of uh, analyzing the concepts uh, behind the Talmud, uh, as Rabbi Lichtenstein, his, his mentor, uh, taught before him and Rabbi Salvechik before him. And um, but not only that, but he's also a, a tremendous spokesperson for the whole of, of Jewish ideology, Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, uh, and Jewish ideas. And um, it is um, uh, is such a privilege for, for us to have him with us. Uh, his, his Torah can be found on whyutorah.org uh, and, and also uh, the Gush is starting to put out videos as well. And he has thousands, literally thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of comments, of thoughts of different Torah. And he's one of the most articulate uh, spokespeople for Torah today. And it's a privilege to have him with us. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Tarragon. And of course, Tu is coming up. So we thought we'd ask the rabbi to speak about relationship of nature and uh, nature and uh, religion. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Lairfeld. Thank you, Rabbi Finkelstein. It's, it's an honor, first of all, just to be with so many people who I miss being with. I've had the honor to be invited to Rabbi Finkelstein so often to the community. I have such fond memories. One of the uh, hardships, one of the many hardships of the crisis is we're not able to be with one another and to form our communities and to share our communities. Hope that will be altered and improved soon. So thank you for inviting me to be part of your Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday late morning, even virtually. It's really an honor to be to be invited uh, yeah, to esteemed communities, to esteemed Rabbanim, and of course, Rabbi Finkelstein and I, hopefully our friendship will continue for many, many years. As Rabbi Finkelstein mentioned, um, I think I have to admit someone. Am I the only co-host? Someone I have to admit into the room? I think someone no, 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 I got it, I got it. You just, you just give okay. sure. No, we have it, don't worry. You're all okay. set. Okay, um, as we talked about, Tu is on the horizon. Rabbi is taking care of all the uh, logistics. And religious people are always looking for additional sources of input, religious experience of connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We sense innately that in nature there lies beauty and purity, nobility, and even sanctity. And when Tu B'Shvat emerges, Tu B'Shvat halachically has very specific rules about when you give a trumos and maestros and what's the cutoff point. But generally it's been taken to be a moment in which Jews ponder our relationship with nature. The Mishnah and Avos, source number one, I'm going to share my screen. I'm sure there are sources that were handed out, but there are sources in Hebrew and in English. I'll read them in Hebrew, but you can follow along in English. Mishnah and Avos has a very strident statement. A person is studying, immersed in the study of his Torah, and he interrupts his study to appreciate a beautiful tree. Ma na'e ilan zeh. Ma na'e nir zeh. How attractive that field is. It's been plowed. So this is a very strident Mishnah. You're appreciating a Kodesh Baruch Hu's masterpiece. You're appreciating nature. And as if you get the death penalty, you're Chayiv Misa. So Rav Kook famously reinterpreted this Mishnah. Nature appreciation should be integrated as part of the pursuit of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. We see a Kodesh Baruch Hu in many different ways. Nature being one aspect, and hopefully today we'll explicate how we're able to access the Rabboni Shalom, God himself, the beauty, the majesty, the enormity of nature. The strident or severe comment of the Mishnah critiques someone who views nature as a disruption of the study, as something disintegrated or severed from religion. 
if you look carefully at the language, if you're studying and then you feel that nature is just an excursion to some world of aesthetics, a world of beauty, entertainment, that severing between religion and nature is a crime equivalent to crimes that would warrant capital punishment. But if nature is just a continuation of your studies and a continuation of a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you integrate the two, not only are you not criminal, you of course are augmenting your religious voice and your religious panorama. So that's our challenge today. How are we to rendezvous with HaKadosh Baruch Hu through nature? What are we meant to find in nature? How is that meant to allow us to appreciate our master and our creator? So I want to discuss five different issues today. Number one, in nature, we sense Hashem's masterpiece and Hashem's morality. The seminal moment in Jewish history is the moment of Har Sinai, when Hashem revealed his word to human beings. It was a once-off event in history, an event never to be repeated, mass revelation, the word of HaKadosh Baruch And since then, Jews are immersed for the last 3,000 years in studying God's word, in applying God's word, in maintaining halacha, and studying his Torah. And that is our most direct interaction with Hashem, studying his revealed word. But what happened before Har Sinai? What happened before mass revelation, before the Avot and Emot had access to the word of God? They were able to sense the presence of a divine architect in the nature that surrounded them, but not only in the science of nature. The others didn't just see stars and planets, oceans, wow. mountains, and as people to, to mute themselves, please, whoever isn't muted. They didn't just sense Hashem in science. They sensed that this world was full of moral spirit. Oh. They sensed that the world was coordinated to support life, to support human welfare, delicately balanced. Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, they sensed a moral energy to this world. They wanted to discover the author of that moral energy. They wanted to craft their lives in the spirit of that moral energy. Please take a look at source number four, very famous medrash describing Avraham's encounter with Hashem. Source number four, Avraham was strolling through this world, observing, processing. He saw a city. A beer is a city, a tower, a fortress. He saw people assembled in communities, families, countries, cities, kingdoms. And he saw that it was full of light and life. It wasn't full of chaos and destruction. He said, Shema Tomar Shahabira Hazelis below Manhig. Is it possible that this city has no architect, there's no designer? When a Jew looks at nature, he doesn't just look at cold, neutral, amoral science. Physics are amoral. There's no morality to physics. They're just equations. They're numbers. There's no morality to math. But when we look at our world, we sense moral energy. And we see life. We see the support of life. Shlomo Melech, the great philosopher, saw intellect, wisdom, science. Source number two, Hashem Bechachma Yasad Aretz. He was able to look at this world and detect the science of this world. David Melech sensed the chesed of Hashem. Source number three, not Hashem Bechachma Yasad Aretz, wasn't attuned to the physics or the math, the chemistry, the astronomy. He was attuned to Olam Chesed Yiboneh. This is a world that's constantly supported by a Kodesh Baruch Hu, rather than left to its random uh, destruction, hostility, violence. Darwin made a lot of people forget about this because Darwin cast nature to us as this ferocious and violent system in which animals are rivals and contesting with each other for survival. And there's a constant cycle of predation and victimization that's not the way a Jew views nature. A Jew views nature, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates a system in which animals feed off of one another, and there's a great chain of being and a great food chain. But ultimately, let's just support the pinnacle of creation, human beings. This is how our Avos sense HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
This is how we're meant to see the world. And to a degree, it wasn't just our avos in the beginning of Rashis when Yaakov delivers the brachos, source number five, to his children. He senses in the various animals sources of brachos. He blesses Yehuda with the strength of a lion. He blesses Dan with the cunning of a serpent. He blesses Binyamin with the predatory prowess of a wolf. Blesses Naphtali with the swiftness of a gazelle. And thousands of years later, one of the Tanoim encouraged us to adopt all of those animal traits in our energetic service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Yudah ben Teimomer, a very famous medrash, have a Amer, more or less playing off of Yaakov Avinu's brachos in Parshas Vayechi. He met, mentions a leopard rather than a snake. Kal Kanesher mentions the swiftness and the lightness of an eagle. Ratz Katzvi mentions Zavtali's bracha, the swiftness of a gazelle, Gibar Kari. But keep in mind that both Yaakov in his brachos in Parshas Vayechi in the end of the book of Bereshit, at the end of Genesis, and Yehudah Yehuda ben Tema, thousands of years later, one of the Tanoim, let's call them roughly 200 years BCE, 100 years BCE, they were looking at the animal kingdom and sensing supernatural strength, cunning, swiftness, flight. They were sensing in animals strength, prowess, predatory ability. And that's dangerous because when we sense in animals only these superhuman strengths, we tend to worship animals. We're reading now about an Egyptian culture that worshipped animals. They worshipped animals precisely because of these superhuman strengths and faculties which animals possessed. And when you worship these superhuman potentials, you can also animalize human beings. That leads to a society of exploitation and violence and subjugation. When we look at animals, we're not just looking at the animal kingdom and at nature the way that Yaakov showcased the strength of a lion or the prowess of a snake. We're looking at it in addition for that moral spirit, the way Rabbi Yochanan saw nature. Let's contrast Rabbi Yochanan's view of nature, cited by the Gemara in Erevin, Source 7, with the view of nature that Yaakov, of course, this isn't his only view, but that he distills for his brachos. Rabbi Yochanan says, look at your world. We could have learned modesty, privacy from a cat. Gezel, minimala, could have learned diligence, honesty, cooperation and coordination from an ant colony who hasn't been fascinated by watching an ant colony, the level of coordination, there's no deception, there's no rivalry, Darwin, there's no rivalry in an ant colony. Arayos miyona, fidelity, sexual fidelity from a dove. Derech eretz mi tarnagol, being private about sexual interactions from a chicken. Shemafais vechar kach boel. Now, Mr. Biochanan wasn't riveted upon the strength the power, the flight, he sends the moral energy that Hashem programmed into this world, in particular animals, in particular representatives. Of course, our desire is to sense the moral energy that suffuses not just particular pivot points and particular elements, a chicken or a cat, but to sense a broader moral spirit that supports life delicately. If our planet will be one centimeter closer to the sun, we'd be incinerated. If our planet would be one centimeter further from the sun, we'd freeze. The science and the physics would still obtain. And to a degree, and I'll try to frame much of our conversation in a corona context, to a degree, we've realized the delicate balance between the animal kingdom and the human sphere. And when a small microbe leaps from the animal kingdom to the human sphere, how much havoc it could wreak. And we appreciate the balance. And I'll talk about the balance a little bit later. So that's the first way that a Jew is able to find a Kaddish Baruch Hu in nature through the morality of nature, the moral spirit. It's a quote um, from William Wordsworth, a late 19th century poet. One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. So of course, as we say in the Gemara, Reisha Katani Sefer Lo Katani, we don't agree with the end of Wordsworth. We don't feel that we can learn more morality from nature than all the sages can. <laughs> we believe that our sages and our texts have a lot to teach us about morality. But we also believe we endorse the Reisha, the beginning of Wordsworth's statement. One impulse from a moral word can teach us moral evil and moral good. And that's why so often in Tanakh and often in Tehillim David Melech's book, we seamlessly shift between discussions of nature 
and discussions of the moral world we inhabit and that we're trying to improve and construct. One famous one is, of course, something we recite every day. It's in source um, number eight. Ose Shamayim Varetz. This is Tehillim Kuf Mem Vav. Esayam Yizkala Sharbam. This is the section of Tehillim we recite right after Ashrei. Kodesh Baruch Hu crafted the heavens, crafted the seas. Shomer Emes Leolam. Now the shift. Ose Mishpat Lashukim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu attends to those who are victimized. Nosin lechem l'reifim, he feeds those who are hungry. Matir asirim, releases those who at any level are in, in, enslaved or, 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 or restricted. Pokeach ivrim, opens our eyes. Okif kifufim, heightens our posture. Ohev tzadikim, it seems like a non sequitur. The first part of the parak discussed nature. The second part of the parak describes HaKadosh Baruch Hu's moral maintenance of our world. For a Jew, they're one and the same. They're not separate conversations. We don't just appreciate the science and the physics of our world. That's not how our Avos discovered Hashem. Avram sensed a bira dolekis, a city of life. David HaMelech sensed Hashem olam chesed yibone. That's the first way that a Jew tries to find a Kaddish Baruch Hu in our natural world. The second way is to try to hear, not just to sense, but to hear. There's a song of nature, and that song praises Hashem on a daily basis. Our ears are not yet capable of hearing most of that song. As you know, our ears can only hear a very, very limited frequency of sound waves. One day, our ears will be able to sense that song. But we think about that song every davening, every day in Shachris, we speak about the angel singing to Hashem. And there is a song in heaven that our ears can't yet hear. There's not just a celestial song, there's a terrestrial song. The matter says the David HaMelech, when he finished Sefer Tehillim, source number nine, he was proud of himself. 150 chapters of Tehillim. Amr Lafan of Rabban Islam, Klomyesh Davar Be'olam Sh'amr Shira Kamosi. Is there any creature that's capable of this grand tapestry of praise? Hashem chuckled. When Hashem chuckled, Nizdam Nalatzvardeh Achas, a frog appeared. Parshas Vaira, frog appeared. Amr Lo, the frog told David, don't be so complacent. Don't be so self-aggrandizing. Frog says, I say a parak of shira Tashem every day. And my phrase is, and every word that comes out of my mouth, the frog says, you can distill 3,000 parables. This anthology of the various songs that every organism in this world sings to Hashem is known as Pirkei Shira. And there are actually people who recite Perkei Shira, the phrases that the frogs sing and the phrases that the birds sing. Now, unfortunately, our ears can't hear it. Maybe one day we will. The modern science of radio astronomy has allowed us to hear sound waves emitting from planets far beyond our galaxy. So science is an ally in opening our minds to parts of our world that ancients were not capable of hearing. But we, yet, we can't yet hear those songs. But there's still a song to nature. And it's not an actual song, the type you'd hear on the radio or listen to on YouTube, but it's a metaphoric song. And it's the song that nature sings to Hashem, not audibly, but it's the synchronicity of nature, the balance of nature, the equilibrium of nature, this grand machine that, that works in such unison and such coordination that's effectively singing to Hashem, much in the way that gears would create music, the gears of a clock, the gears of a, those who've studied string theory. There's actually a music to our universe based on the coordination of the planets and the orbit of the planets. And to help appreciate the coordination and the song that the coordination of our universe provides. Let's take a quick look at chapter 104 in Psalms, because this is a chapter we recite on Rosh Chodesh. We just recited it on Thursday. Some recite it during Mincha and Shabbos. But this chapter encapsulates how delicately balanced nature is, how delicately coordinated it is, and effectively, that coordination is a song to God. I want to highlight three aspects of synchronicity of this chapter. Verses number eight and nine 
speak about the delicate coordination of the oceans and dry land. That coordination is felt most powerfully on the coastal mountains that serve as boundaries between oceans and dry lands. That's why the cliffs and the mountains have so much precipitation, cloud cover, rainforests, because they serve as boundaries between the ocean and the fury of the ocean that can, in theory, engulf dry land and human habitat. We need the ocean, we need condensation. The sand as well. This section doesn't speak about the sand as much, but there are other sections. Yalu Harim, Yerdu Vikos, the clouds ascend up the mountains, go down into the valleys. El Makomze Yesarata Lehem, Givol Samta, you set a boundary. Bal Yeshuvon, the waters will not once again engulf the earth because before our world was created, the entire space was covered with waters of chaos, of tau vavo. And Hashem separated upper waters from lower waters. And then he separated the lower waters into oceans, into dry land. But the forces of those waters are so powerful that they always threaten to engulf dry land, either through precipitation or simply through tsunami and waves. And Hashem sets up, Hashem arranges barriers, sand barriers, mountain barriers. Kuvul Samta, source number 12, verse number 9. That's one form of coordination that this chapter known as Baruch Nafshti, celebrating the beauty of Hashem through the coordination of nature. Verses 20 through 23 describes the coordination between daytime and nighttime. That's also rotations that Hashem creates. At night, most humans, whenever we define night, obviously electricity has extended the day. We go to sleep, we retire to our homes, we're not that nocturnal. This is an opportunity for nocturnal scavengers and predators. Spring to life. Toshes Choshech, source number 20. Night falls. He Laila. Botirmos Kol Chaisoyar. Now all the beasts of the jungle begin to forage and scavenge. Hakifirim, the little cubs, Shogim Lataref, they're screeching in their caves for food. Worrying about their food and their mother lioness will go forage for food or hunt for food. Verse 22, Tizra Hashemesh, now the sun rises. Everyone out of the pool. All your animals, back into your dens, back into your caves, back into your forests, back into your jungles. Tizra Hashemesh, Yeo Seifun. The Elmion Osam, Yerbatsun, they run back. Why? Now is the time for man. Yetzi Adam Lefalo, man goes to work. Vela Vodaso, Adearev, until nightfall. So day and night are carefully calibrated. We would say in our terminology, the jungle and human habitat are calibrated. Animals remain in the jungle. Human habitats are carved out spaces where animals don't invade. The event of Arov blurred those boundaries and reminded people about how delicate those boundaries are. Verse number 25. Through number 26, another balance. Hashem created these large oceans. They're absolutely necessary to support life. The oxygen that's produced from oceans, the water, the food source, the source of life. But they're untamable. Human beings can't tame them. We haven't even begun to map the oceans, the depths of the oceans. But if the oceans were to separate human beings, we couldn't travel. We couldn't interact. We couldn't trade. Ze'ayam gadal, it's a huge ocean. Or chav yadayim, shemremes ve'en mispar. Innumerable organisms, chayos, kitanos, and gadolos, small algae, and huge leviathans. But what happens? Despite the fact that these oceans are impassable and untamable, verse number 26, sham aniyos yehalechon, the boats can seafare and cross the ocean and engage in trade and visit. So the song that we can hear is not just a, a, a audible song, but if you look at nature and not just appreciate the moral spirit, but the level of coordination, precision, and synchronization that nature exhibits reflects the hand of Hashem. So we are able to find the moral energy of our world. We're able to appreciate the delicacy, the delicate equilibrium of nature. Then there's a third access point 
for a religious person. And that's the grandeur of nature, the majesty of nature, the sweep of nature, the enormity of nature. When we see a world that's beyond human scale, beyond human ability, we're sensing the infinity of Hashem in part. And sensing the infinity of Hashem, the magnitude and the sweep of nature that represents the enormity and the infinity of Hashem, we gain proportion upon human experience. And proportion is such a crucial, crucial modality for moral life. Every sin is a moment of myopia in which we abdicate long-term vision for short-term necessities. It is a tragic barter because we lose our proportion. Our imagination closes. We need something in the immediate and we barter our future and we exchange our eternity. And proportion restores that vision and hopefully allows us to avoid some of those sins. David HaMelech describes this in source number 15. Hashem Adonainu, Ma dir shimcha b'chal aretz, asher tenahot chal ha-shamayim, I see the splendor of your heavens. Ki ere shamecha, masay etzbo secha, I see the heavens, the planets, yereach kochavim asher konanta, the stars that you established and that you have fixed. Ma enosh ki tiskirenu, uven adam ki tifkidenu, what is man? He senses the fragility, the delicacy, the balance, the proportion. The Rambam is more expository, source number 14 in Hilchas Yisod Atara. When a person studies Maisav Uvru of Hanifloim Hagidolim, the masterpiece of God, Vigiramahim Chachmaso Shein Laerch Velokates, and he sees the infinite wisdom. On the one hand, he's brought to passion and desire to know more. On the other hand, the Rambam writes, Uchemechashe Bidvar Maido Atzmam, when he considers the enormity of this world, this universe, miyad hu nir teleacharav. He recoils. The afachet, he's af not afraid in terms of fear, but he realizes he's an infinitesimal speck of dust. Beria ketana shefeila feila. Life is about balancing between empowerment, self-esteem, recognizing our potential, employing our potential, changing this world, but not letting it get to our heads and not losing the proportion of human experience and of our personal lives. And nature is meant to restore that proportion. It's extremely important in our world because ironically, as large as the world is becoming, the world is also becoming smaller and more narrow. It's ironic. One of the great authors of the 20th century who I enjoy reading is Kafka. Kafka wrote and operated between the two wars, between World War I and World War II. For Jews, World War II was more traumatic and devastating, obviously because of the Holocaust. But in terms of altering human consciousness, World War I was more of a cultural and institutional tsunami than World War II. It wiped away the ancient world of monarchies and introduced a whole new world of mass murder, of trench warfare, of redistributed European countries. It was a complete seismic shift of human experience. And people didn't realize how much the world was changing. Kafka realized it. And in his writings, you get a sense of realizing the coming tidal wave that would affect humanity. Kafka wrote, as a result of war, I've highlighted on my sheet, America has come to Europe. The continents have shrunk together. A spark carries a man's voice around the world in an instance. We no longer live in space cut to human size, but on a small lost star surrounded by millions of larger and smaller worlds. What a prophetic statement. Kafka is writing this around... 40 years before we actually scale the heavens and realize how many planets there are and how small our world is. Solar space looms up like an act of vengeance. In its abysses, we lose more and more of our freedom of movement day by day. Fascinating irony. We're losing our freedom because we realize how small, I believe it can't last much longer. The world is changing into a ghetto. The world is opening out, but we are driven into narrow defiles of paper, bureaucracy and narrowness. The only certainty is the chair one sits on. We live in straight lines, yet every man is in fact a labyrinth. So the world shrinks, and with that, our imagination shrinks. We forget our story, the story of our lives and the story of our people. And when we're in that small space of myopic blindness, it's easier to sin because the moment becomes more powerful and the story that we're living becomes less compelling. 
And if we sense the story, and nature helps us sense the story, another poet that I enjoy reading, same period, John Keats. Then on the shore of the wide world, I stand alone and think to love and fame, to nothingness do sink. When's the last time you became too indulgent in fame? And then you thought about something larger and the transience and fleeting nature of fame, and it sunk to nothingness or the loves that we pay, the wages of love we pay in places we shouldn't play them. Nature has that restorative capacity to restore our proportion. And this is something which one of our great Tanaim sensed, Rebbe Meir. The Gemara says in Menachos, why are tzitzes so uniquely qualified to remind us of all the mitzvahs? What about tzitzes? Is a memory jogger and allows us to avoid that tragic myopia. If Mary says it's all about the color, since it's had that color blue, the trellis, that thank God so many of us have been able to restore to our lives. An early manishtana for Pesach. What makes trellis so powerful, so compelling? You see the blue on your string, and you immediately associate it with the ocean. And then your mind travels to the ocean, you voyage mentally to the ocean, and then you journey across the horizon where the ocean meets the heavens, and now your imagination scales the heavens. And once you're in heaven, you ascend to God. So a small string of blue yanks you out of an imaginative prison of narrowness, makes you ponder larger systems, Oceans, skies, heaven, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Then you realize, I, I can't, I can't abandon that, just for the next moment of false pleasure, false hope, fame, artifice, self in, in self-aggrandizement. So it's that third aspect of nature, not not an interface to encounter Hashem, but a proportion restore, a perspective restore. Remember when we used to fly in planes, you no longer, most of us no longer fly. And on the way, we used to land and see our cities from above, the small little boxes and small cars and street lights and buildings. And we saw our lives from a different perspective. We saw our day-to-day lives, but not from the street level, but from the plane level, from 10,000 feet up. And for a moment, we think about life in a, from a different vantage point, from a different perspective, because we're seeing it from a different perspective. And nature is meant to restore that perspective. Number four, when a Jew thinks about nature, he doesn't just think about a system that's static. Until now, I've described a system that's static, that's able to showcase the morality, the moral spirit of Hashem, able to um, showcase the poetry of Hashem's song, the synchronicity of our world, able to showcase proportion. But for a Jew, nature is dynamic. And nature is impacted by human history and human behavior. And in nature, we see a mirror of human behavior. It's a report card for how we're faring as humanity, as individuals, but more importantly, as a human race and as the vanguard of the human race, Jewish people. And we're able to detect human behavior in two aspects of nature. One is is nature cooperating with humanity? In Gan Eden, where our world was perfect and our condition was perfect, it was absolute cooperation. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, source number 18, Hayer Rabbi Huda ben Tema Omer. Remember the same Rabbi Huda ben Tema, I think it's the same Rabbi Huda ben Tema, who spoke about the different aspects of nature, the lion is Rabbi Huda ben Tema, source number six. This is now Rabbi Huda ben Tema, thinking about Gan Eden, the same person, evidently Rabbi ben Tema had a sensitivity to nature. Adam HaRishon, Mesiv Be'Gan Eden Haya. He was reclining in Gan Eden. Hayu Malachai Asharit Salun Lo Basar. The angels were roasting meat. Masanun Lo Yayin. I know that Rabbi Finkelstein once showed me, right, the Nasbi at least, it used to be a big barbecue, right? One Sunday you had a big barbecue and everyone came. Imagine if the angels were roasting meat at the barbecue, chilling the wine, chilling the beer cooler. This is, of course, actual, but it's also a metaphor in which nature is completely cooperative. Man didn't have to work. There were no thorns, no thistles, no hard work, no brow-beating work. 
But as man fell, nature fell, and the level of cooperation dwindled. And as man began to restore his state of Gan Eden, all of a sudden nature comes alive. And we see nature coming alive in the level of cooperation. Mir Hashem will read Parsha's bow this week. And one of the qu- bizarre psukim in Parsha's bow, why do we care about this? Ulechol b'nei Yisrael, source 20, lo yecharatz kelev l'shonu l'meishviyad behima. This seems so trivial, so meaningless. Parsha's bow describes grand historical events. And the Torah goes out of its way to describe the fact that dogs weren't barking. Who cares? The answer is the dogs weren't barking because barking that night would have disrupted the prophecy, would have disrupted. And nature was cooperating with redemption. The dogs were cooperating with a larger historical process because when redemption is in the air, human beings are advancing towards a better state. And nature wants to cooperate, so the dogs are quiet. But it weren't just the dogs. A lot of animal cooperation in the end of Bo. In the end of Bo, we read about a special mitzvah surrounding donkeys. Firstborn of kosher animals have to be delivered to the Kohen. What about firstborn of non-kosher animals? We don't really care, except for one exception firstborn offspring of donkeys. Donkeys aren't kosher, yet the firstborn has to either be redeemed or beheaded. Why the donkeys? Why the donkeys? What, what privilege do the donkeys have? They make it into Parsha's bow. Rashi says, he quotes the Gemara, because the donkeys assisted the Jewish people on their way out of Egypt, carrying their fare, their belongings, their gold, their clothing. What do we care? Of course they assist them, but the question is not what happened, but why do we care? And why do we enshrine this moment with a mitzvah? The answer is because it once again demonstrates nature cooperating with Jewish history because Jewish history is spearheading the advance of human experience in human history. Or as we say in our Hallel, Hayam Ravayanos, the sea leapt up. This is not just about the splitting of the sea, which we'll read about in two weeks. This is about all of nature dancing. The water splitting was a form of nature dancing. It wasn't just logistical to get them from one stage or one bank to the other bank. There's merriment, there's joy, there's excitement. Hayam Ravayanos, Hayarden, the Jordan River is also gleeful. Heharim Raktu Chayelim, the mountains are dancing like land, like uh, rams. Givos Kifnet Zone. Malachayam Kitanos, why are you so happy? Because Hashem is coming and his people, Beis Yisrael Me'amloes, Haisa Yehudel Kacha. So we detect nature's excitement and cooperation. And a second way to detect it is through nature's fertility. Remember the spies return with these outsized, humongous fruits? Vayavod Nachal Eshkol, source 24, Vayichrusim Isham Zemara, Vayeshkol Anavim. Echad, two people were carrying the famous picture of the grapes on the Carmel wines on the Israeli tourist insignia, two people carrying a, a cluster of grapes. The Jews are about to come to Israel. Nature is providing her fertility. Outsized fruits. Nature is ready to welcome the Jews. And by welcoming the Jews to advance towards utopia, nature is alive. And then when the Jews left Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, nature went into hibernation, at least in our land. For 2,000 years, the land of Israel remained parched and cursed, untillable and arid, a land that bore the curse of God's people and their betrayal of history. And then suddenly, no culture, no empire was able to capture and harness the fertility of this land until her children returned. Aim habanim semecha. And once again, the land is blooming and fertile and alive. 
And this is one of the signs that we know this is our return. This is history is calling us. We ask, what are the signs that this is real? This isn't a mirage. It's the miraculous transition of our desert land, not just into a bloom, but a country that allows other countries to bloom in a very literal way by providing water maintenance, and of course, in a larger sense. This is the prophecy of Yechezkel, the day that Mashiach comes or the period of Mashiach comes. So it's number 25. There'll be a rivulet that comes out of the Beis Hamikdash. It will grow in its strength. It will provide fish. It will provide medicinal. Food. Its fruit will be edible. And its leaves will be medicinal. Pharmaceutical, of course, this could all be metaf- metaphoric, not just actual. So we see in nature, not just the landscape for Hashem's moral energy and not just the proportion restore, but we see it as a mirror. We're able to detect where we are in history. How are we faring? How is human conduct? Are we cursing the land because of our behavior? Or are we enjoying the land's bounty and its potential because of our fidelity? The final component of nature, for me at least, that allows a religious person to think religiously is the restorative power of nature. We are all born into this world pure and noble. One of the fundamental differences between Judaism and Christianity is the notion of original sin. Sex isn't sinful. We're not born into this world crooked and broken. We don't require a redemption from another source. God made man, Kitov, noble and upright, possessing an innate purity. Unfortunately, the world strips us of that purity. We become contaminated. We lose our original purity. We lose our original innocence. And so much of our journey is not just for improvement, but for restoration. Chadesh yameinu kekedem is our plea not just to improve, but can we dis- rediscover the person we once were? I always find it helpful to ask myself the following question. I pose this to my Talmudim, and I pose it to you as well. Can you remember the time before? Now finish the sentence. Each person finishes the sentence differently. Can you become the person before? There was always a before in our lives, before when we were younger, we had plans, dreams, purity, fidelity, faith, loyalty, and then something happened. We took a wrong turn. We lost some of it. We suffered tragedy. We became lesser versions of ourselves. And tshuva is not just penitence and improvement, it's restoration. How can I return to who I once was? When we wake up every morning and we see the restoration of nature and the renewal, it builds hope. And if the birds can chirp and the sun can rise, as we say, the sun will rise tomorrow, and that fresh, vernal smell will repeat, well, then maybe we can also reestablish ourselves. Maybe our lives aren't linear but cyclical. Maybe we can reset ourselves based on the past. Or as Wordsworth one wrote, once wrote, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. There's a cyclical sense to nature, a renewal. And that has to build hope in ourselves to restore our own purity. As we grow from children to men, we lose our innocence. But Shuva in the dream of Chadi Shemena Kekedem exhorts us to restore that purity. And nature convinces us that we can. Those are five ways that we can grow as Ovde Hashem, as religious minded people, to our interaction with nature. The morality, the synchronicity, the majesty and the proportion that nature provides, the image of our behavior that we can detect in the quality, the caliber of nature. And finally, the saga of restoration that nature provides. Of course, it's important every year to Bishvat, but especially this year on two levels. First of all, as I mentioned before, I think so much of us appreciate some of that delicacy of nature and how 
fragile the boundaries of nature are and how when those boundaries are upset, throw we're all suffering billions of people because of one person who ate a bat. And that person who ate a bat allowed those boundaries to be blurred. But those boundaries are being maintained minute by minute by Kodesh Baruch Hu. Why Kodesh Baruch Hu decided to allow those boundaries to be blurred a year ago? Hard to know. We don't always understand his will. But those boundaries are always delicate and they're always being maintained. But also because I fear that the pandemic we're suffering can lead to a villainization of nature. As if this virus, if you were, if you were asked to draw the virus, would you draw it with a happy face or a mean face? The answer is, it's just a virus. It's just part of nature. Its effects have been mendacious. it has been overwhelming. But there's nothing menacing about nature. That's how the ancients saw nature. They saw nature as violent. God's is grotesque. Natural causes is random. To a degree, that's how I mentioned before, it's Darwin cast nature. That is not the way we view nature. Nature is a product of Hashem. It's a product of an Av HaRachamim. It's a product of Melech HaRachamim. And Hashem is Mechadish B'cha Yom Tamid Maaseh Voracious. And when we see the rising sun, it's not just an astronomical event, but it is a moral event. Li Ose Orim Gidolim Ki Li Olam Chazda Mechadish B'tuva B'cha Yom Tamid Maaseh Voracious Kamor Li Ose Orim Gidolim and we can't let the suffering that humanity is now enduring based on this encroachment by nature to toxify or to create a sense that nature is noxious. Because God forbid that may also affect, and I fear terribly, it may also affect people's view of God. I think we have some work to do after this pandemic. We are all believers. We see a world that suffers, it's dark and evil, but we know that God has his reasons and we're able to, hopefully, with so many people who are the fringes of belief, what will this pandemic do to them? How will they be able to walk away with a sense of a Kodesh Baruch who is a merciful God, Shalom, Tova, Chesed? That is our challenge. It's one of our challenges. So at least on Tu B'Shvat, when we think about God's masterpiece and our habitat, these are some voices that help us frame it as a religious experience, as Rav Cook said, returning to our first source, that we shouldn't see appreciating a tree as a hefsik. If it's a hefsik, if it's irrelevant, unrelated to our religious journey, then you're right. It should not in any way occupy time better spent. But if it complements, then it's part of our religious odyssey. Tu b'shvat sameach to everyone, and hopefully we'll have a chance to see one another, maybe before next year's Tu B'Shvat, but if not, then to share some Tu B'Shvat fruit together. Thank you so much, Reverend Tarragon. Uh, really, uh, just I, I was thinking, you know, what are you going to say? And I was thinking about a different different themes and to have been exposed to so many new new ideas about a relationship of, of nature and religion and our, 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 our Judaism. Uh, it's really uh, such a such a pleasure. Uh, as you can see, Robert Tarragon is just is an amazing spokesperson for Jewish ideas and ideals. I do want to thank our, our hosts and our uh, sponsors today. Of course, we partnered with uh, the Baron Hirsch Congregation and want to uh, welcome all the members of Baron Hirsch who are here with us and members of ASB who are here with us as well. And also uh, was sponsored specifically by Dr. Phil and Barbara Lieberman. Uh, they always also thinking of their parents, of Herman and Dora Lieberman, uh, of blessed memory. And we want to thank them for that opportunity. So, uh, Rabbi Tari, are you open to questions, or um, do we post some questions on the uh, chat, or uh, do you have to go? I'm fine. I'm, I've mar I've Marv in 25 minutes, so we're 20 okay. minutes. Maybe one or two questions. If any any comments? Uh, uh, so she, yeah, we can get that. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you to everyone to uh, just answering some of the chats. Eileen Posner, I am from Baltimore, but uh, Diane Lita was my uh, Hashem, was my cousin's wife. It's a big family, Baruch Hashem. Um, I think Rabbi Finkelstein has the source sheet, and Brad, a big uh, for Shlema to you and to Shana, uh, to Shana and to, to everyone. As of Hashem, we should have the fruits together. Well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, right, Tanner, I want to say thank you especially for that notion of the harmony of nature. I've always appreciated that song of the um, 
the sea split. It was a whole new idea of the sea splitting, uh, the notion and uh, and the future prophecies of Yechezkel, the notion of uh, looking forward to a real harmony, uh, the singing together, in the beautiful song that we and nature can sing together with along with Jewish history. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Have a good day, everyone, and best of health to everyone.